<clears throat> Please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 this morning. We'll be reading verses 1 through 9. And at this time, I just want to uh, thank Thomas and Janet for uh, helping us out with the music this morning. It is much appreciated. Uh, Romans chapter 12. We'll begin in verse 1, reading down through verse 9. And I just want to encourage you to bring your Bibles to church. It's important uh, to have your Bibles open, uh, following along uh, with uh, me in the text. You'll get, uh, I guarantee, much more out of it if you do that than simply listening to the sermon. So I want to encourage you, bring your Bibles to church. If you don't have one with you this morning, uh, there are Bibles before you in the pew as well. Romans uh, chapter 12, uh, reading one verses 1 through verse 9 here. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. There is an account recorded from early on in the war between the states where in one occasion President Abraham Lincoln called at the home of General George McClellan to consult with him on a military matter. The general had gone to a reception. Lincoln waited for a considerable time and finally the general returned. He walked down the hall and ascended the stairs to his bedroom in spite of the fact that word had been given to him of his visitor. After some minutes, a second message was sent. The word came back that McClellan had gone to bed. Lincoln never spoke of that incident, but he did not call again on McClellan until the great crisis of September 1862, when he went to McClellan's house and asked him to take charge of the defeated and disorganized Army of the Potomac, which Lee had trounced in the Second Battle of Bull Run. When Lincoln's friends objected, because of the condescending and prideful attitude which McClellan showed towards the president, Lincoln said, I would be willing to hold McClellan's horse if he only will give victory to our army. Abraham Lincoln was a man who understand the value of humility. Humility gives you and me that rare ability to look beyond ourselves. It gives you the power to look at things greater than your own pride and self-centeredness. And in doing, so, in doing so, gives you a realistic assessment of yourselves, of others, and of the world around you. Humility is one of the foundational virtues of Christian morality. And it is to this virtue that Paul calls us in this passage this morning. Again, Romans 12, verse 3. Paul says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. As we saw last week, chapter 12, Paul brings us to a new section in the epistle to the Romans. He wants us to see the consequences of all the theology that he laid out in the first 11 chapters. Last week, we looked at the first conclusion. It was that upon the basis of God's mercy, you are to offer up your life as a living sacrifice to God. And Paul explained that doing so involves a lifelong process of bringing your minds and your bodies into conformity with the will and word of God. Now, beginning here with verse 3, Paul wants us to draw a second conclusion to all this theology. It is this, that based on God's grace, you are to use your gifts with humility and towards unity. 
Charles Hodge, one of the most respected theologians of the 19th century, in his commentary on Romans, sums it up better, well, better than anyone else could. He says, As the apostle had concluded the doctrinal portion of the epistle with the preceding chapter, in accordance with his almost uniform practice, he deduces from these doctrines several important practical lessons. The first deduction from the exhibition what he made of the mercy of God and the redemption of men is that they should devote themselves as living sacrifices and be conformed to his will and not the manners of the world. The second is that they should be humble and not allow the diversity of their gifts to destroy the sense of unity in the body of Christ. These various gifts are to be exercised not for selfish purposes but in a manner consistent with their nature and in their design, diligently, disinterestedly, and kindly. We can see that in these verses here. You'll notice the therefore in verse 1 and then the for in verse 3. What undergirds the therefore in verse 1? He says, I therefore beseech you by the mercies of God. And what undergirds the, verse, uh, the word for in verse 3? He says, for I say, the grace given me. He says, the foundation for everything he's about to present to you is the grace and mercy of God. That is what underlies the therefore, the for, in both of these instances. You must understand that the grace and mercy to grasp humility and to battle your pride. This becomes especially interesting as Paul addresses humility. He begins by talking about grace for a specific reason. Now, some New Testament scholars will say that he refers to grace given him here as a reference to his apostolic office. And everything that he says, he can say this because he is an apostle. But I don't believe that the context of this passage justifies such a narrow usage of the word grace. Now, I don't think the grace referred to here refers to that extraordinary grace that God gave to the apostles, but instead it refers to that ordinary grace that all of us receive. That ordinary grace through which God works in us the gifts of justification, sanctification, redemption, and service. It seems that Paul wants to impress upon us the need for grace and mercy, not only generally, but for a specific reason. And it is this reason. I believe that Paul isn't using the word grace here generally and generically as we often do. We talk about the grace of God as something we need in our lives, but so often we don't speak about how that grace is manifested personally and practically. And I believe Paul uses the word grace here in a very personal way and practical method because the reason for that is that he struggles with the very issue that he's about to bring up. He says that this grace was shown to me. He doesn't use it generally or generically. He says, no, this is a grace that I need. And the reason for that, I believe, is because he's stressing the point that this is an issue that he wrestles with personally. I believe that when we talk about lack of humility, about pride, that this was Paul's besetting sin, that this was the thorn in his flesh that he refers to in 2 Corinthians. In that passage, you'll know that he refers to a thorn in his flesh that he prayed for three times that God would take away from him. Now, there's been much speculation as to what this thorn was. Some people say it was an eyesight problem. Others say it was homosexuality. But I believe by the context of that passage, and it dovetails nicely what we see here, that the pride uh, the pride, lack of humility, was Paul's besetting sin. As a matter of fact, if you look at that passage in 2 Corinthians, he talks about the abundance of revelations that he's received. And I believe if you look at the context of all that, it's dealing with Paul's ability to become prideful and his lack of humility and the divisions and the dissensions that would come about in his ministry from that. In fact, if you look throughout Paul's writings and Luke's narrative, I think this flushes itself out. Now, this is a, bit, a little bit speculative here, but I think speculation is warranted in this case. Look in Acts. We see Paul parting ways with Barnabas. Now, was there a good reason to have a disagreement over whether to take John Mark on the second missionary journey? Yes, I think there was. But it also seems that Paul's attitude, his pride, made the division a little more sharp than it needed to be. Take him and Peter in the account in Acts. Yes, for sure. 
Was Paul's rebuke of Peter justified for his bad doctrine? Absolutely. But was the attitude with which he rebuked him necessary? Perhaps not. I believe most would think not so. Now, if you take my suggestion on here, there's an important point that we can distill from this. We need grace personally. Not just generally and generically, but we need God to show his grace in the lives that we live out on a day-by-day -day basis. We need God to show his grace, to apply God's grace to those sins that you and I especially struggle with. There's one more point of application that we should distill from all this, and that the truth is that pastors really do earnestly struggle against the sins against which they, or I should say we, preach. Now, it's no secret that pastors, as we all know, are not exempt from the vices of laziness and lust and greed. But let me suggest, let actually Paul suggest from this passage, that one of the greatest vices with which pastors struggle is pride. It's the one vice which is natural to the office. It's the one vice which also has the most potential to do real and lasting damage to the churches they minister in. A lack of humility. Now leadership positions, I believe, naturally tend to dealing with pride. But pastors especially so, because not only do they have to lead, they also have to teach. And they do so as God's ordained ambassadors. And this tends to, every once in a while, give them an overinflated view of their own importance. It's something I must be on guard against. It's something, quite frankly, that you must be on guard against in me. And it's something that the leadership of this church has to be on guard against in every pastor. It's not an easy thing to address, admittedly. But pointing it out is essential. And that's exactly what Paul says. Paul says, because of the grace given me, I can talk to you about this. Because God is still working on me with this issue, I can talk to you about it frank frankly and share with you my struggles. God is ex still extending grace and forgiveness and transforming power in this area of my life. Therefore, he admits it. He doesn't admit it because he, the readers don't already know. Matter of fact, there's one sin that you can hide less than all other sins, and that's pride. You can pick it up within a moment of meeting a person, can't you? Humility is the one that needs hidden. Pride is out there for everyone to see. No, he does not confess it because they do not know it. He confesses it because they want, he wants them to know that he knows it and that he's working on it. Humility is important for everyone, but it's especially important for a pastor to tend to, to let his flock, his congregation, know that this is something that he must work on. The absence of humility and the presence of hypocrisy is the very bottom of just about every failed minister that you can think of out there. Now, the absence of humility and the presence of hypocrisy. That hypocrisy says, no, I as the pastor don't need anyone's help. I can handle this on my own. I can keep this to myself. Paul says, no, no, I admit to you, I need grace and help in this area of my life. He's transparent about it. He needs the transforming power of God's grace. Now, of course, this problem is not limited to pastors by no means. Indeed, we all struggle with pride and lack of humility. Again, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think highly of himself or more highly than he ought to think. Last week we saw that Paul told us to renew our minds. And now he shows us a concrete example of how to do that. He says here is how you do think now. You need to stop thinking that way and start thinking new thoughts. This is Paul's prescription in just about every one of his epistles. He says, stop thinking this way, start thinking this way. Stop thinking according to the principles of the world and your nature, but instead start thinking according to the principles of the Word of God and according to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I would say it's the natural thinking of mankind from the very beginning of birth to think quite highly of himself, to think that they are the center of the universe, and everything that the world throws at us encourages that view. 
I was just at a uh, conference uh, last week at Slippery Rock Baptist uh, Camp and Pastor uh, Marty Vaughn was there giving a lecture on money. But he gave this illustration that I think equally applies to pride. He says he was on a cruise with one of his friends and they found out there was a jewelry sale going on uh, at one of these uh, rooms on the cruise ship. And Dr. Vaughn had no interest but his friend, I guess, is an investor, so he went down to see what he was going on. When he got down there, he found that it was a room full of all women and I think only two men. And there was a lady there selling jewelry. And they said, before we even start the auction here, uh, you need to do something. We're going to go through a little exercise. Everyone needs to say together that I need this jewelry. I'm worth it. I want it. I'll have it. And he said this lady started getting these people to repeat this. And then they started chanting this. And then these women almost got into a frenzy. I need this. I want it. I'm worth it. I got to have it. He said it almost turned into a religious service with these women repeating this time and time again. But isn't that what the world tells us every step of the way? I need it. I'm worth it. I want to have it. A self-centered view of ourselves. But God says, no, no. You must not think highly of yourself. You must think nobly. You must think objectively. You must take stock of yourself in the way that God sees you. What's interesting is the words Paul uses here. He says that every man that is among you not to think highly of himself, more highly than he ought to think, but to think of himself more soberly. What is one of the characteristics of being not sober, of being drunk, right? You misjudge the value of things. When you're drunk, your judgment is impaired. Your reaction time slows. Your ability to reason fails, and your standards are lowered. That's what happens when we're drunk, and that's what Paul says is the light characterizes the mind of the unbeliever when he thinks about himself. He can't think objectively about the situation. Instead, his judgment is inebriated. Paul says, no, you need to think objectively about yourself. You need to think soberly about yourself. You have to be reasonable. You have to have a clear mind about who you are and what you are and what you do. What's interesting, he says the cure not to thinking highly of yourself, he doesn't say to think lowly of yourself. For when we do that, it just brings false humility. He doesn't say the opposite of thinking highly is to think lowly of yourself. No, he says the opposite of thinking highly of yourself is to think soberly of yourself. Think with a measure of reason. Think with a measure of object objectivity. This is a difficult thing for all of us to do, but Paul says we must do it. It's very difficult to find a man who can think reasonably about himself, to take an objective stock of his life, his gifts, his value, and make an objective, neutral judgment. What's funny is when we go to judge others, that problem doesn't really exist. If you grade this sermon, generally all of you would get together and give it a similar grade. But if you were up here giving your own sermon a grade, it's likely that sermon wouldn't be the same grade that everyone else gives to you. And this goes with anything in our lives. We all tend to agree on a similar basis when we judge someone's gifts or someone's talents or someone's character. And generally, when we talk to others, they agree with us on that. But when it comes to ourselves, there's always a bit of a blind spot, isn't it? There are very few men who can take a reasonable, objective view of themselves and be right of it. So Paul says, take care to think soberly of yourselves. Be objective. Don't be drunk with your own self-importance. Instead, try to be clear-headed, logical, objective. Take stock of what you really are and what you really do. What's interesting is Paul uses this word soberly, and I mentioned this in our Sunday school class this morning. So often, the Bible has a lot more to say on subjects than we think and in a lot different way than we think we think we know that they say. Being sober is one of the Bible's virtues that it brings out. Now, it's unfortunate when we talk about alcohol in our churches that all we bring up is the idea of whether or not to drink. But that uh, so much does disjustice to what we see in the scriptures. Instead, it's not the vice of drinking that the Bible objects to. It's the virtue of being sober-minded. And this is what Paul calls us to do, to be sober-minded, to be clear and logical, to be able to think reasonable about our lives. As a matter of fact, we saw this in verse 1. Paul calls us to offer up our reasonable service, to think logically, objectively, to remove from those minds those prejudices, those effects that would cloud 
our thinking. Now, what is interesting is that uh, many people who struggle with alcoholism and uh, drugs, uh, that is one thing that's sober, that one thing that keeps the mind from being sober, but that is not the only thing. Many people can be drunk on their own self-importance and never touch wine or drugs. Many people have the vices of pride. Many people are befuddled by the power and anger and jealousy and greed that affect their minds greater than any chemical could disrupt that system. Ladies and gentlemen, we must take everything out of our mind, not just uh, chemical substances, but those emotional things that keep us from thinking clearly. You and I have to get those things out of our life, out of our mind, that are stopping us from thinking clearly and objectively about ourselves, others, and the world around us. Yes, if pride is the source of your problems, if jealousy is the source of your problems, if greed is the source of your problems, if anger is the source of your problems, it's no different than being drunk on your own self-importance. I was thinking about this illustration. If I went on away on vacation and I came back and heard that the church split because at one of the recent dinners, uh, someone brought in some uh, booze and uh, spiked the punch, and a fight broke out, and you decided you couldn't live with uh, each other, I don't think I would be much upset. But if, on the other hand, I came back from vacation and found that the church split because you disagreed in a meeting over what color the carpet should be, then, then I would be upset. Then you had no clear thinking in your mind. Then you let your pride and lack of humility get in the way of the things that really matter. Verse 3, one last time to make another point. Paul says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. If pride is the problem, Paul prescribes a hot cup of humility to sober us up. He says you have to understand everything you have, all your gifts, your callings, your opinions, your ideas, your money, your background, your own body, your very own mind, don't you get it? This is all a gift from God. What right do you have to be prideful of these things? When it comes to a gift, pride is not an option. Only thankful humility remains. To press this point home, Paul uses the word faith at the very end of verse 3. He says, think soberly according, to the, according as God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. This isn't the way we would expect Paul to use the word faith. Uh, well, Paul uses the word faith several ways. In one way, he can speak of the word faith as a noun, uh, the faith in which we believe. When we speak of the Christian faith, that body of truth which we believe in, the Christian faith as a noun. Other times, he uses faith as a verb, meaning the act of believing in those truths. But in this passage, he doesn't use faith in either of those ways. Instead, when he says, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, he's referring to the effect that faith brings in you. When you take your belief and put it in Jesus Christ, and when you put your faith in the faith, he works through faith in you to bring about graces and gifts that he gives to you for the church's good. That's what Paul says. He says, your faith was a gift. A gift from God wrought by the Holy Spirit. And everything that flows from that faith, everything you do, everything you are, is also a gift of God. So what could you possibly be prideful for in that situation? What a shame it is when we take those good things that God has given you and me for the upbuilding of the church, for the uplifting of others, instead use those to upbuild ourselves and run down others. This is how the thinking of the world works. Instead of seeing these things as faith, a gift from God, for which we ought to be thankful and humble, instead we take everything we've got, everything we are, and use them as a point of pride. Paul says that must never be. You must transform your thinking. Charles Hodd says, A right estimate can never be other than a very humble one, since whatever there is good in us is not ourselves, but of God. Paul goes on to explain what we should do with this gift of humility once we understand that these gifts, these graces are for, from God. He says in verses 4 and 5, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, 
and everyone members one of another. The metaphor of a body is one that Paul likes to use to describe the church. We see that in Corinthians as we read this morning and also here. He emphasizes the proper relationship between unity and diversity in the body. Now last week we realized that Paul told us to offer our bodies up as a living sacrifice. And I explained to you in that case that Paul used the word soma there instead of the word he had been using early in Romans, sarx. Sarx refers to God, the body as it is corrupted in sin, flesh. But soma just refers to the body. The body neutrally, the body objectively. And he said, yes, you need to offer up your body as a good, a living, and acceptable sacrifice to God. But now he tells us how that comes about. Your body becomes a good and living and acceptable sacrifice to God because it begins to be united. It becomes united to that only truly good and acceptable and living and perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. You see, you become united to Jesus Christ in his sacrifice. That is how you become holy, acceptable, and perfect before God. But what's interesting is, he, is this. When I become united to Christ, and you become united to Christ, we become united one to another. That's a difficult thing. It's an easy thing to think about in practice. It's a beautiful thing to think about in theory. But when it comes to actually living as one body with one another, with different gifts and different ideas and different opinions, then it becomes a little more difficult. Think about it in the marriage covenant. You unite yourself to one person, which you choose. Here, you're uniting yourself to 50 people, which probably you wouldn't choose if you had a choice to make on your own. So we can expect, in the marriage relationship, there are difficulties to work through. There are dissensions, there are arguments, but yet, you must work through them. In this body, there are difficulties, there are differences of opinions, different skills, different ideas, but God says, we must work through them. Because we were given these gifts not for ourselves, but for each other. These gifts aren't given to make yourself look good. Instead, they're given so that you might serve your fellow mankind. It's not easy, and it's contrary to the message we get from our society and from many of our churches today. There's no such thing as a me and Jesus Christianity. It's us and Jesus. We must work together for the advancement of his kingdom. We must become a part of the harmonious whole. We do not become the whole in itself. We must become a part of a body. The church, and in the church, we partake of all those blessings and burdens, all those joys and sorrows, all those rights and responsibilities that come with being united to one another through being united through our head and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, it is difficult, and we'll find that this becomes even more difficult in next week's passage, but we must understand that everything we've been given is an issue of humble thankfulness for the building up of the body. That's the goal we must be about. That's what we must appeal to personally and constantly to the grace of God for in this church. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we're after in this passage and everything that comes after it, realizing that our gifts are from God to be used for God. Let us accept them with humble thankfulness and use them for the advancement of his kingdom and the building of this church. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these words of instructions. We thank you that you constantly express and extend grace and mercy to us. Lord, we confess our pride, and each one of us in this room are guilty of it. Lord, we just pray that we might think soberly of ourselves, that we might realize that we've been given the gift of salvation, and everything that flows from that is a gift just as much. We just ask that we might find our gifts and that we might use them not to build ourselves up, but instead to build others up. Not to run each other down, but instead to advance your kingdom. Lord, we just pray that we might apply these truths to our hearts in very practical ways this week. Help us to try, with everything we do, with everything uh, we say, with everything we think, to think soberly of ourselves, to think reasonably, to think clear-minded, and help us to replace those thoughts of pride and self-centeredness thoughts of humility and thankfulness. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the truly good and acceptable and perfect sacrifice. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
this time, if the ushers would make their way to the front, we are going to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. And just a few words of instructions uh, before we get started. Here at First Baptist, we practice what's called open communion, meaning you're not uh, needed to be a member of this church to join with us. Instead, if you're a guest visiting here, you're welcome to. The only thing that we ask is that you uh, can testify that you have been saved uh, by the power of Jesus Christ, uh, that you have been baptized and are a member of a local church as well. Uh, if that's the case, we encourage you to come forward and partake in the Lord's Supper. If uh, you don't uh, have that or don't quite understand all that, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Because Paul does give us uh, an admonition when we uh, partake of the table. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and body of our Lord Jesus Christ. But let a man examine himself. And so let us eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is an important thing that we do. When we take this cup, when we take uh, the bread, we're testifying that we are Christians, and that we are united to the body of Christ through our head, and we have a right relationship not only with him, but the fellow believers uh, that we are united with. And to think upon those things you know, uh, as we prepare our hearts for uh, the receiving of the Lord's Supper. Think about how we are united to Christ. Consider those things. Uh, consider how we are united to one another through the partaking of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> this time, I'm going to distribute the bread. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask John Millard to please pray over the bread. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for the many blessings that you have given each and every one of us. But Father, as we uh, partake of this bread, uh, let the remembrance of Jesus Christ run through our hearts and our minds. We ask these things in Jesus' name. 
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. Take, let us eat together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which we have the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you and take uh, this ordinance. Lord, you've commanded us to do this. And we just pray that by doing so, we might give witness to the world that we have been united to you in Christ. Lord, we just pray that this might be witnessed by the fact that we have a humility, a humility that seeks to love one another, to build one another up in faith. Lord, we thank you for these things and pray them in the name of our Lord and Jesus Christ, the true and living and acceptable Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. As the scriptures say, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We're going to conclude our service by singing hymn number 200, the church's one foundation. Hymn number 200, the church's one foundation. Please stand.